This morning we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, and then we'll also be looking at Jeremiah 23. I believe the texts are in your bulletin as well. So Today we're talking about losing religion and finding God. I think there is a way that each one of us can get off track at times. I don't know if you have a good sense of direction or a poor sense of direction. Or maybe you're one of those people who has a poor sense of direction, but you actually think you have a good sense of direction. You don't need a compass and you don't need a map and you end up going and you rode in Timbuktu and you meant to go to Australia and you're wondering how you got there. Um, and some people, maybe we have a map. Maybe we know we need a map, but we don't quite know what to do with it. We don't quite know how to read it properly. And so we think we're following the directions because we need, know we need direction. But maybe we're holding the map upside down and we're going north instead of south or whatever it might be. These things can happen as well. Have you ever heard, well, I thought that's what you meant when you said that. Uh, I meant to bring a cartoon this morning and I forgot about it, but I saw this cartoon online. It's the doctor and the husband and the wife. You know the scene. And he's saying, push, push. And the next pain, the husband pushes the wife off the bed. The doctor says, no, no, I meant her. And he says, yeah, I did push her. What's the problem? I did what you told me to do. Now, that's obviously a very humorous thing. I don't know if that's ever happened in life. Hopefully not. Uh, but that is a way that we can be saying one thing and someone else can hear something different. Or we, maybe we're like the husband in that cartoon, we think that we are hearing someone correctly. We think we're doing something according to some kind of instructions, according to some kind of ways of doing it, and yet that wasn't at all the intent. In other words, we're holding our map upside down. And we're really good at it. See, no matter what it is in life, we can get off track, whether it be uh, intentionally or unintentionally. And I don't think religion is devoid of that. <clears throat> I think in our own spaces, whether it be our own religion or other religions, we've seen people can get off track. Uh, a definition of religion is that it is a, a set of behaviors or ritual practices based upon an, or based on an agreed set of beliefs. So we have our beliefs. As Christians, we believe in God. We believe in Jesus. And we have certain behaviors and certain practices uh, that go along with that that are meant to boost our faith or bolster our faith that are meant to sort of Track, track us in a certain direction. But sometimes, even though we have the blueprint or we have the map, we can inevitably flip it upside down and think we're going one way and actually be going a different direction. We see an example of this in the Bible many, many times, in particular looking at the Old Testament, tracking into the New Testament where Jesus is constantly coming to the religious leaders of the day and saying, you're, you're doing it wrong. You've got it all upside down. You've got it all backwards. Maybe you've got an intent. You've got a way that you think it should be done. You think you're following my ways, but actually, in reality, you've missed the boat somewhere. See, they created this religious system that was supposed to draw them closer to God. And for some people it did, and for other people it didn't. As the years went on, it became a very exclusive, a very legalistic, and in fact, a very corrupt system as the Pharisees were sort of uh, tagging alongside the Roman government and getting benefits that way and so forth. Um, this can happen. You hear people today, I think every week I run into either a person uh, who I'm talking with or a video or a podcast that I'm researching from, something where someone has been affected by the church negatively. And it oftentimes starts with them saying things like, well, I came from a very legalistic church, right? And it discolored their view of church, their view of God entirely, and, and so they 
turned away. And maybe they came back to God, but don't no longer go to church. Maybe they never left God, but in fact just left the church. And there's all these things going around because some kind of system was meant to do one thing, and actually for that person, it did the entirely opposite thing. And I don't want us to think of this as a way to point fingers at the other person, because that's always our tendency, right? Our tendency is to say, well, you know, they can whatever, whatever. I think they can deal with them and we can deal with us. So as our place in religion, as our spot we're sitting in, how do we engage with this? How do we constantly be fervent to know sort of what way we're holding up the map? And when we meet people who have an sort of animosity uh, against church, which we love so much, how do we travel with that? For ourselves. Not say, well, that person, whatever, or maybe that church. No, how do we do that? Because we're part of a church. So how do we engage with that? How do we process that? How do we think through that? Just one example, which we'll talk about in a moment, about sort of uh, legalism that started out as something that was useful and ended up becoming something that was incredibly not useful uh, in the Bible is circumcision. This is one of those uh, rules, shall we say, one of these guidelines that was put there for a purpose, for a good purpose. To the ancient uh, Hebrews, it was a similar thing to baptism for us. It was a physical reminder of their commitment to God. A physical reminder that they were now heading in a different direction than they once were. And that's good. But it became a source of pride for them. And instead of fostering humility before God, they said, well, we're the circumcised and these people, they are the uncircumcised. So they either need to be circumcised to become part of us or we don't want anything to do with them. And this is where we enter into the text in Ephesians 2, where it's talking about the circumcision and the uncircumcision, and we'll travel with that for a bit. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 11, <clears throat> says, So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So at one time, religion estranged the Gentiles. Even those who wanted to meet with God. You remember the story we looked at a little bit ago about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? Uh, that was a couple months ago, I think now. Well, there was this, this foreigner who was a eunuch. He had two problems, right? He was a foreigner, and also he couldn't have possibly been circumcised because he was a eunuch. So these are his two issues. And he went to go and worship God in the temple. And when he's meeting with Philip, it says he's just come back from the temple. But what it doesn't say is what happened when he went there. And because of all of the, the uh, sort of rules and guidelines to who can enter the temple and who can't, who's allowed to worship God and who isn't, uh, we can surmise that he was refused entry at the door, even though he wanted to enter into the presence of God. This is the way things like this can go a different direction than they were intended. And in these respects, the Pharisees or the religious leaders of these times perhaps took things a little bit too far. Became teachers of something that is in fact not the way of God. We would call that a false teacher. Teaching something false and not something true. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And to turn Jeremiah 23, we'll turn back to Ephesians 2 uh, after Jeremiah and continue on. But this, this kind of gives a context of where we're going here. Um, because this is a warning to those who are false teachers, to those who have accidentally or maybe on purpose turned their map upside down and are going in a wrong direction, are leading in a wrong direction, are teaching in a wrong direction because of something other than their desire to follow Jesus. Jeremiah 23, starting at verse 1, it says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and who scatter the sheep of my pasture, 
says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away. You have not attended to them, so I will not attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. <clears throat> and then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all of the lands where I have driven them. I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they will not fear any longer or be dismayed. Nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall ex execute justice and righteousness in the land. And all that to say it is important as teachers, this is now me preaching to myself, to not just express our own opinions. I think it's important to not just promote our favorite rituals. To not only lead according to our own backgrounds, but to find a way to include other elements and other things that maybe don't work as well for us, but they work better for other people. To try to bring everyone in. Because if we have one way of leading, or one way of, this, this could be a church, this could be a, a, a family, this could be anything. If we have one way of doing that thing, and that one way is causing people to feel unwelcome, perhaps there is something we can do to not seek to scatter, but seek to gather. And I'm not saying that that means we have to uh, sort of put our morals on the sidelines or, or something like that. Uh, but there are things that we can do in our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own ways of processing through things that are maybe the, not, not the way that we personally would do it, but the way that is more helpful for the ultimate desire of the group, which would be to gather people together, not seeking to scatter. And so, yes, I have my opinions. And I can't preach without sort of expressing my opinions, but I try to be honest about them and challenge us when we maybe we have opinions that uh, have the potential of being those things that could, um, could scatter people. But also understanding that even though your opinion might be different than my opinion at the end of the day, that's what I love about question and answer period of time, it's more just comment and and whatever it is, um, is that if you have an opinion that's working for you, I'm not here to change that. I'm here to help us think in different ways, help us process through things, help us discern what the Spirit is saying to us in our own hearts. And there might be something new that, that I've said that all of a sudden uh, says, oh, I've never thought about it that way. That makes a lot more sense than what I actually have thought before. Or it might be that you completely disagree with what I said and it really irks you and it really bothers you and it really, you could never think that way and that's okay. Because we're all different. We all travel with things differently. The biggest question is not what are our differences, but the biggest factor is what are our similarities? What do we, how does this work together? I think um, as we go through things, as we deal with things, as we butt heads with things, as we find out what our differences are, we know how these travel based on the fruit, right? As it says, you know the tree by its fruit. So I don't think it's about the tree, I think it's about the fruit. It's not necessarily exclusively about our, our theology or about our church attendance or about our passion for religion, but... It's about the fruit that those things grow. So what's our fruit look like? See, if our theology is causing us to fall away, then perhaps we need to rethink our theology. But if it's making us better, even though someone else might say that it's wrong, well, don't feel you have to change it. However, also know that your 
theology is not a one size fits all for everyone you meet. And so that's the way we can take that, not as sort of me as a, as a shepherd in this scene, but ourselves as a shepherd, as we seek to spread the gospel, know that there might be different ways of people understanding these things and know that that's good and healthy as long as those things are leading in the right direction, as long as the fruit is healthy, right? Um, in verse 4, it talks about these types of shepherds. Uh, it says, I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them. And they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. Versus the shepherds who scatter and destroy. So there's two types of shepherds. Now I've heard this verse uh, spoken of, say preached on, but it has been it was spoken of by people who say this is why, this is everything that's wrong with the church in these verses. These shepherds that come in and have their way of saying things and just seek to scatter and destroy, and that's why I don't go to church anymore. And I'm, uh, I know that is the case. I know these people exist. But I also know there are other types of shepherds who are called. The ones in verse 4 who are raised up out of these spaces, who are there for the purpose of gathering God's people back together. So I don't think we can write off the whole thing, but I think we have to be honest that there are both sides to this equation. So for our own selves, is our fruit scattering or is our fruit destroying? Because <clears throat> you know the tree by its fruit. If the fruit is false, then surely the tree is false as well, and something needs to change in that respect. I think false prophets breed false religion and breed false conversions. We hear these things all the time where someone has, has sort of subscribed to a certain thing and they're going in a certain way and it actually has led them in a wrong direction and they start questioning their whole uh, sort of upbringing or the whole things they've dealt with. And sort of these shepherds, as we've seen, God says, woe is you. Because you're not just affecting yourself, you're affecting everyone that you are meeting and teaching and shepherding along the way and that is a great deal to me. So is the religion that we love so dearly, is that religion that we preach encouraging people or discouraging people? I'm not asking whether they accept it or hear it or any of that, but is it something that is encouraging them? Is it welcoming or is it ostracizing? Is it accepting or is it condemning? Yes, we have our differences, but what is it that matters? What is it that unites us? To turn back to Ephesians 2, we continue on and we see the core, the foundation of that very thing, that even though all these things come up, what is that thing that sort of we travel with? Ephesians 2, 13. Now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace in his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. See, religion can scare some people off, but love conquers fear. The love of Christ conquers fear. That is the thing that we gather for. That is the thing that brings us back together. The fact that we love Christ and he Loved us first. So I think just because maybe we've been burned by a church group somewhere along the way, that doesn't necessarily mean we need to give up on the whole thing. Because there can be peace, despite our differences. There can be these second shepherds that come in in verse 4, after verse 1 of Jeremiah 23, where after you've been scattered, there's another person, another shepherd that comes in and gathers you back. There can be peace even though we feel like sometimes there's war. Christ unites those who once felt hostility towards each other. Why is that? Because we can all agree that your way isn't necessarily wrong. Your way is perhaps just different. Jesus, when he was on the earth, met all sorts of different people with all sorts of opinions, with all sorts of ways of dealing with life. And sometimes he adamantly challenged their ways of thinking, 
and he did that for those who were very far off, sort of in the Gentile spectrum, and he did that for those who were very religious in the, the Pharisaic sort of spectrum. He just looked at their hearts, didn't care where they came from, didn't care sort of how they tra traveled with it. He says, what's important is how do you deal with me? How does it affect your life? And how do we move forward? And so verse 15, it goes on in Ephesians 2. It says, he's abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might uh, create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So the law is this system of ancient Jewish religious rituals. That's what's being talked about here. He says, such systems have been abolished. See, because he says, it's not the system that saves us, but it's Christ who saves us. And yes, we have our systems. Yes, we have our religions. They still exist all over the place, and they change face, and they look different, or they look the same. We all have those ways that we prefer to connect with God. But he says, that is not the thing that saves us. What saves us is Christ. And we need to keep that in perspective. We all come together with the same intent, with the same spirit. See, if we let these differences scatter us, then what are we really fighting for? Are we fighting for Christ or are we fighting for our religious opinions? As I said, I forget how many weeks ago, it's a dangerous place to be when we are a church without the Holy Spirit. When we're a church that is all about our own sort of spirit, or our own agenda, or our own way of doing things, our own way of guiding things, because it's a spiritual place. So if the Holy Spirit isn't there, some other spirit is going to come in and inhabit us and work through us and be breeding some alternate way than the way of Christ. So I think these are things we have to keep in our heads as we travel with this. What is the spirit that I'm coming to this situation in? Is it because that person has now poo-pooed my church or my family or my denomination or whatever it might be, and so now I feel antagonistic against them? Or is it something different entirely? There's a difference between not liking Jesus and not liking your particular expression of church. And though we might like it, and we can be offended that they don't like it, sometimes those feelings can get in the way of what actually matters and what actually, what actually we travel with. So where do we go with that? Because the Spirit of God is one of unity, one of acceptance, one of love, one of forgiveness, one of peace. That's the fruit. Verse 17 talks about this Spirit. <clears throat> says, he came and he proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So peace to both groups who were fighting at one time or another. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit or in one spirit to the Father. We have access to the Father in one spirit. It's that one commonality that unites us. Let's continue on verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundations of the apostles and of the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here's an interesting question as we read this verse. We so often think of the Holy Spirit sort of dwelling inside of me, and I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. But how does this verse phrase that? It says in verse 21, the whole structure is joined together and grows into the temple of the Lord. The whole thing together is where the Spirit resides. Not just me personally. It's not me who's the temple, it's us who are the temple. Together, we are the church. 
And as we recognize the handiwork of God in others, our vision of God all of a sudden expands to so much greater than myself. That God is no longer this, this sort of way of looking at things or this guy who's doing things for me, but he's there for everyone. And we can see beauty in that. Anyone who's gone to a, a, a third world country or in fact been in any kind of different unfamiliar culture than themselves has seen this where they're doing things in an entirely different way, they're worshiping God in an entirely different way, and yet there's some kind of freshness to it that we receive. We go, this is the same spirit. And it opens up our eyes to see things in a different way than we've seen it before, realizing that God is so much bigger than I ever imagined before, that God's temple is so much bigger than just me. So his temple grows as we unite together so the question I think to leave us with is how's our fruit I don't want to talk about what's your opinion about this particular way of doing this particular religious thing we all have those opinions and we can talk all day about those things but what's important is the fruit so for you individually, I wanted to challenge you. How is your fruit? When you talk about God with people, when you talk about church, when you come to church, when you go through some of these things with your community, how does that fruit look? Is it something that is fostering unity and acceptance and love and forgiveness and peace? Or is it something that's fostering alternate fruit? We can take that, take that question before the Lord and sort of ask him to show us ways in which our, our fruit is not lining up the way it should, ways in which we can work through these things to, to better be his hand and feet in our community.